you can't just change the laws of physics and solve the hard problem of consciousness. Right. It's not a matter of the dynamics of the wave function. That's not what the question is about. So you haven't solved it. So getting back to the to the uh, real aspect of that question was, you know, can a machine think? Um, so here's our friend Albert, and he feels happy. You know, there he is smiling, and he's in free fall. Uh, so I just did a demonstration, but for those of you who are, you know, I got to give the alternate text. So those of you that are listening, I just dropped my finger puppet of Albert Einstein. All of them have seen this guys. Be I even have a finger puppet of Noam Chomsky, if you can believe it. Someday there'll be one of you, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, but I want to ask you, can a computer have a sensation of happiness, A, and then B, can it visualize through a human experience or, or a sort of perspective, free fall in Einstein's case, uh, that leads to an insight that is sort of the culmination, at least of this book, but maybe as one of my late great colleagues, Hans Parr, used to say, the culmination of Western civilization is GR. So where do you come down on this? Well, I think that it's important here, as in many cases, to distinguish between questions of principle and practice. Uh, I'm on Bostrom's side in the sense that, in principle, I don't think there's any thought that human beings can think that a machine couldn't think also. But there's a big gap between making that statement and saying, any day now, we're going to have uh, theoretical physicists replaced by artificial intelligence, okay? Because I don't think we're anywhere close to that in the near term, for more or less exactly the reasons that Chomsky was highlighting. Um, and I've had people on my podcast who have talked about this but way back from the early days. Lisa Aziza Zadeh was uh, someone who talked about embodied cognition, where the fact that we have bodies really matters. It matters a lot to how we think. As a matter of fact, does it need to? I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a different kind of thought that happens completely irrespective of bodies. But as a matter of fact, the way human beings think is highly conditioned on the fact that our brains are part of bodies, right? Unless you're a dualist, unless you're really a Cartesian dualist and think that the, the mind is completely separate from the body, these two things are related. And forget, about, I mean, you, you raise interesting and important things about sensation and experience, but I think of motivation and values and goals, right? You know, human beings get hungry and we get tired and we get cranky in ways that Angry, computers yeah. just don't, right? And I think that's important. I think that we we are open systems that are constantly, you know, experiencing from a very different point of view. I had a, a psychoanalyst on Mari Rudy who was talking about the Lacanian theory of lack, hmm. and I, I think that it's actually quite closely connected to, to the fact that we need free energy as physical systems to survive. We're open systems. We're dynamical. You know, like I can uh, the, the example I often give is you can sit as stationary as you want and you can be mindful and you can slow your breathing but your heart is still beating <laughs> your atps are still being generated in your mitochondria right there's a lot of churn going on beneath the surface because you are a dynamical system and if you don't take in resources from the environment you will very quickly break down on cosmic time scale. sean is this your way of telling me you need a coffee break or i, I just you know i just give hints i don't i don't say things explicitly <laughs> i speak in parables um but but look you know this is something where maybe someday we'll have computers who mimic that and then mm -hmm. they'll become very human-like in their thought process i see no reason why not but again i don't think we're anywhere close so. yeah i asked that of nick i said well yeah maybe it would be behoove us to take you know our computers and like pull a pop a circuit breaker or you pull a capacitor every now and then to tell it uh, what what pain feels like but he, he sort of startled you know, he looked at me like i just kicked his dog or something so he, <laughs> he's a he's a delightful guy that episode i don't know if that came out before or after this episode but look for that um, and you have a wonderful interview with him as well sticking with quantum mechanics and also a relativity um, so I, as I mentioned, I had on uh, our friend, mutual friend, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, who is delightful as ever at age 91. Um, and you know that he has this orchestrated OR theory, which he didn't have when I read uh, Emperor's New Mind. Uh, it came about afterwards because uh, a man by the name of Stuart Hameroff, who's an anesthesiologist at uh, University of Arizona, contacted him after that book and said, you better look at these microtubules. So I had on Stuart and Roger on to talk about this. and. Um, and we went into some detail about it, but one of the things I kind of pressed him on, and I don't know that he had really talked about it, is, you know, does consciousness exist 
in non, you know, Copenhagen interpretation framework. So in other words, would it exist? And I know you hate this phrase, but most of my colleagues or most of the listeners will be more familiar with the many worlds interpretation. I know you don't use that, but let's just call it that for simplicity. Um, in the many worlds, I, I asked him, you know, would consciousness uh, take place because there is no collapse. So there's no orchestrated, uh, you know, objective uh, reduction. So in your mind, um, and he said well, he doesn't believe that you're right. <laughs> uh, so he doesn't have to answer that question. Um, so I want to ask you, in fairness to you, I mean, he wasn't like, you know, denigrating any Everett or, or anything that you've worked on, but he's just saying he doesn't believe in that. So therefore, it's an irrelevant question. And then he, you know, he, sn he snorted at me. Um, does gravity play a role in consciousness or does gravity play a role in quantum mechanics? Let me ask that question, because in his model, you have the wild curvature, you have this, this collapse that is instantiated by some gravitational process that I don't fully understand happening in the microtubules, which are operating in a squishy, wet, warm, room temperature environment. But is it, okay, I'm not going to say is it conceivable, because you always say that's your least favorite type of question on your AMAs, <laughs> which I listen to as a supporter on uh, Patreon, and everyone should support Sean. But anyway. Could consciousness be affected by gravity, Sean? I, you know, not in my view. <laughs> and look, just to so the audience is able to put these things in perspective. There's yeah. there's two things going on here. One is um, Penrose has an idea about the foundations of quantum mechanics, one in which the Schrodinger equation is not always true because wave functions explicitly collapse onto random things under the right circumstances, and those circumstances are governed by something having to do with gravity. And you're, you're not alone in not knowing exactly when that is. It seems to be a little bit difficult for people who are not named Roger Penrose to pin down when exactly that collapse happens. The other is the connection to consciousness. And, you know, I, I'm not even going to talk about that because I don't understand it and I don't care that much. Uh, I'm a physicalist about consciousness. I think that whatever consciousness is, it could happen under whatever interpretation of quantum mechanics you want. But just so everyone knows out there, I mean, it's not even in principle a solution to what David Chalmers would call the hard problem of consciousness. There's Chalmers would be very quick to tell you, you can't just change the laws of physics and solve the hard problem of consciousness. Right. It's not a matter of the dynamics of the wave function. That's not what the question is about. So you haven't solved it. And it's not really what Penrose wants to solve. What he wants to solve is the calculational capacity of human cognition, which is a different thing than what we think of as the hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the other, and he has elaborate arguments involving Kurt Gödel and computations, which I don't find convincing either, and, and experts in the field don't find convincing. Right. But on the pure quantum mechanics level, um, his theory belongs in a category of theories known as objective collapse theories, and they're treated as fairly respectable, but certainly minority points of view among people who think about the foundations of quantum mechanics. It gets a lot more airtime on podcasts and in the public media because yeah. it's Roger Penrose. Yeah. <laughs> but there are a bunch of people who work very, very seriously on the foundations of quantum mechanics, and they do not think a lot about Penrose and Hameroff's uh, orchestrated objective reduction theory. Yeah, I agree. That's that's certainly true. And I think, you know, they, yes, it's, it's fun to talk to them. It's actually really interesting to talk to Stewart as well, uh, because he does do things uh, that, uh, you know, he can be an experimentalist and, uh, and actually play around in some sense, as he says, uh, with anesthesiology and, and putting his patients to sleep. And that's what he gets paid to do. I said, join the club. That's, that's what I do when, when I'm teaching. Come on, Stuart. Well, and also it's important to point out that, of course, they could be right. I'm, I'm letting people know that they have a very, very minority point of view that is not popular among physicists or philosophers in the foundations of quantum mechanics. doesn't mean they're not right, but right. I think there are reasons why their view is not popular. And part of it you sort of alluded to when you you know say it's kind of hard to pin down what their point of view is, uh, which is not a hallmark of a well-constructed scientific theory. 